Ken Young uh, tonight lecturing at the AA. Uh, the lecture would be titled, as you might have read on the website, uh, Echo Architecture, and we'll be discussing Ken's uh, uh, work on green design and master planning as an ecology-driven approach that is focusing on biodiversity and designing buildings as constructed ecosystems. Uh, Ken is a graduate of the AA where he finished here some time ago, around uh, 1971. He has been, uh, he received a doctorate from the University of Cambridge where he also attended courses in environmental biology. And uh, he also did some uh, environmental land use planning at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his buildings include, uh, they have been kind of uh, built all over Asia uh, with the most notable ones being the IBM building in Malaysia, also uh, Solaris in Singapore, the Genome Research Building in Hong Kong, and the, the Great Ormond Street Hospital extension in London. Uh, Ken is run, running a practice over in Malaysia with uh, Robert Hamza, uh, and also has offices in the UK, in London, as Llewellyn Davis Young and Ken Young Design, and also in China as the North China uh, Architectural and Engineering Company. Uh, what will be presented is Ken's work on master planning, green design, and quite a few of his uh, ideas and theories about uh, green architecture. So please, with that, uh, welcome Ken Yang to the AA. Oh, thank you, Costas. Costas <laughs> used to work for us. And, we, and you know, everything does so expensive, we say Costas a bomb. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing for the last couple of decades, and it's on eco-architecture, eco-master planning, and what differentiates what we do from other eco-architects is that our work is very ideas and concepts driven, and I'm going to go through some of these ideas with you today. Now, if you ask any architect in practice today, he'll tell you that he does green design because if you don't do green design, you're nowhere. And so what differentiates different architects from green who does green design is the shades of greenness. How green are you? How authentic are you? And so I want to start by defining green design, redefining it um, from an ecological point of view. Now, the ecologist sees the earth as covered by this thin film called the biosphere, which is where living organisms exist. And this is, for me, the context for green design because the Earth existed in a state of stasis until almost around the, the uh, Industrial Revolution when, when we started to, to have huge impacts on the, on the biosphere. And so nature is, for me, the first thing we consider in green design. And nature is about climate, it's about <coughs> ecosystems, about flora and fauna. Um, natural resources, and the physical environment. Now, within nature, there are different species, of course. Uh, us human beings is one of the many species in nature. But we are the most powerful of all species. So the second factor we have to take into consideration is, is us as humans, our activities, our industries, our commerce, our agriculture, our mobility, and everything that we do as human beings on the biosphere. As the most powerful species, we can change climates, we can ch devastate landscapes. And as Spider-Man says, if you have immense power, you have to be very prudent with it, which we haven't been. Then the third factor in green design is water. Water is what life is about. Without water, no organisms can exist. And so water is rain, it's waterways, and we need to close the cycle, the water cycle as much as possible. Otherwise, the water that falls on the ground goes into drains, into rivers, into the sea, and it's gone forever. And then the third thing we do is that we make things as human beings. You know, I call this the built environment. It's not, the built environment is not just buildings, but everything that we make and do as human beings, refrigerators, toys, clothes, machines, and so forth, bring all these together into a seamless and benign whole is what green design is about. And this, to me, is the most compelling aspect that we have to address as architects and designers today. The outcome, I call this constructed ecosystems, which is a seamless integration of all these four fa factors into an armature for green design. 
Now, um, I started doing green design back in the 70s. In those days, um, nobody's had a green design. I was accused of being called a hippie, and that I couldn't find a suitable way to introduce green design, except by looking at green design from the first factor, which is climate. Then I started to found, discovered that actually the world's climate varies immensely. Even with tropical climates, you have tropical humid, you have tropical island. And at that time, I started practicing in Kuala Lumpur, and um, Kuala Lumpur is in, in 2.9 degrees above the equator, and it is um, hot, humid, tropical. And so this is one of my early projects. It's heavily influenced by Corbusier because I just finished doing research and I needed a style and I doubled Cabuzier, and we looked at, this is called a roof roof house, because it's got double roof, it's got the louvered roof over a, a green uh, a roof terrace, uh, which is one of the five principles of Cabuzier's um, mantra. This is the sun path in the, uh, in the tropics, and so I started by looking at sun and wind as the two key factors influencing the design, sun, wind and rain. This is the site, north is a little bit to, to, the, uh, the, to the one side of the site, and that the idea was to have a roof that would cool the house underneath. It would let in the morning sun, keep out the hot midday sun, and keep out the afternoon sun. And so here's the louvered roof that goes over the morning sun. You can see the morning sun coming in, into the pool. And that's the, this is the north face of the house. And this is the pool, which, which acts as an evaporative cooling device. The idea was that the wind would come into the house, would go through a pool, which would cool the wind and cool the house. And the house had a series of operable uh, walls, uh, glass doors, uh, which slide out, and you can see cross ventilation north, south, east, and west. This is the staircase going to the upper floor, and that's a, the image of the staircase. House was completed back in 1985, and it's actually my own house. I, I built it for myself back then. And I started to discover things, just like the idea of a wing wall, where a, a wall that is a, a wing to the side of the house actually collects the wind and drives it into the dining space. And so this was an interesting idea, and which I started to develop, you know, used it again in, on another project about 10 years later. This is the passageway from the entry of the house and there it is, uh, this passageway. And, and the design of the house is, is to try and avoid being an island within a pe the, the plot. And so what I've done is that I have designed the inside spaces, the geometry, so it, it diverges out into the space between the house and the, part and the garden, so that I have, the house becomes a series of courtyards. So altogether there are four courtyards, A, B, C, D, and E, or five courtyards. And so in this way, I blur the, the differentiation between the inside and the outside. So that was the theme for this house. And this is the uh, quiet garden, and this is the view from the quiet garden looking back to the house. And so with the idea of the, of the louvers, I started to consider the house to think of buildings as an environmental filter. A filter, a, a, the enclosure as a filter that filters the, the, the climate or the, 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 the relationship between the outside and the inside and the environment between, uh, between the outside and the inside. And, and one of the ideas I had was what I call the Z-shaped roof so that the wind can go through, the rain's collected. So as you know, the wind and the rain are enemies. When the rain and wind enters the house, if it rains, it brings in the wind. And so the biggest challenge in designing the tropics is how to keep out the rain and let the wind through. And so this is the livid roof for this skyscraper that we did. And this was again finished in the late 80s. And I'm very glad to have my friend Charles Jenks here because he, said, he once taught me, he taught me all I know about Corbusier. He said the four shapes that Corbusier uses is the banjo, the mandolin, and the piano. And so you can see the top right hand corner, this is my tribute <coughs> to the Corbusier. I had a piano shaped uh, window on the upper right hand corner. Now this is all well, you know, fine the, uh, in the tropics where it is mostly hot, it's mostly one season. How about the cold climate? So we fast forward um, a few years, a few decades. This is a scheme that we designed in Korea in a, in a district called Gyeonggi, uh, which is about 20 minutes from Seoul. 
And in the cold climate, you have two extreme um, uh, uh, seasons. You have very hot summer and a very cold winter, and two very nice mid-seasons, which is spring and autumn. And so bioclimatic design in cold climates means you have to have different responses for different climates. And so in winter, the, the, uh, the atrium is shut to become a winter garden. Um, in the mid-seasons, they open to let the wind in. And then in the summer, you can either close it air condition it, or you can open it all to the full. And so by, that, by the 90s, I started to move from bioclimatic design and design climate to become full ecological design. I started to consider um, the vegetation ecology in the biosphere. And then, I've, this then became clear to me that different parts of the Earth have different ecology. You know, no part of the Earth is exactly the same, even if it's in the same you know, district. And so I started looking at vegetation, and an ecologist sees the Earth as covered by this thin film. But within this thin film, the biosphere, there are units which they call ecosystems. And ecosystems are communities of plants, animals, of uh, and the physical environment, or the biotic environment and the abiotic constituents acting together to form a whole. And that is what differentiates an organic environment and an inorganic environment. Then when I started to look at this diagram, this understanding of what ecosystem is, that struck me that, that everything that you and I design as architects is physical. If you take this room that we are in, everything is physical and there's nothing organic except you and the bugs and the bacteria. So where is the biotic constituents? And so for me, ecological design, green design has to start with bringing these together now I started to look at what I call eco-mimesis, designing to Im imitate the properties and attributes of ecological systems. And when you look at the structure of the ecological system, as, as you can see here, this is structure, in, not in the engineering sense, structure in the, uh, in the proportion of the, of the constituents. You find that uh, the inorganic, the organic environment is missing. Now, another way of looking at green design is to see bio-design, eco-design as bio-integration. Now here's a poor gentleman uh, with prosthetic devices all over his body, and he has a prosthetic leg, and you know, the thing above his leg is actually part of his prosthesis, so the lady shouldn't get too excited about it. But um, every prosthetic device is connected to a host organism. So that means you know, the host organism is the organic aspect, and prosthetic is artificial, it's synthetic, it is human-made. Now, by analogy, what is the host organism for buildings? The host organism for buildings is the biosphere. Now, the success of any prosthetic device is what I call biointegration. If it doesn't biointegrate properly, effectively and successfully, then either the human organism, the host organism dies, or the prosthetic device you know, uh, drops off or fails. And so this is what, to me, green design is about. How do you integrate the prosthetic device, the built environment, the human environment, as the equivalent prosthetic device with its organic host? And solving this, to me, is the million dollar question in green design. If you're able to integrate all these together into, in a seamless benign way, then we have a truly green uh, built environment. So I started to look at bio this, you know, a bio-integration and I want to define it. And to me, um, there could be three possible ways of bio-integration. Physical, um, that means just cheek by jowl, if you like. Systemic as a system. And temporal, in the use of uh, resources over time. And so physical bio-integration is integrating with the existing features and the ecology of the environment. Systemic is integrating with this ecosystemic and the biospheric process that takes place in nature, and temporal is the balance of the use of non-renewable resources and renewable resources over time. And so these are the three ways we can bio-integrate um, what we do as human beings with the natural environment. So uh, I started, then I moved on to look at physical integration and asked myself, what are the ways we can integrate the organic with the inorganic? And I produce this diagram, which is, uh, you can either put everything in one location, which I call juxtapositioning, you can have a spotty relationship, which I call intermixing, 
or you have an integrating, uh, integrative relationship, which is the third one. And above are, are equivalent to master plans. Uh, it's, it's actually a map of Manhattan. You can put all the green vegetation in one location. It's in Central Park, where you have a spotty relationship, as you can see in the second diagram, um, like Georgian London with Tavistock Square, Eastern Square, Bedford Square. Or you can, the third diagram is the preferred ecological <coughs> diagram, where you have ecological corridors and, and fingers, which then integrates both the organic and inorganic in a much more holistic way. I started to experiment to find out how we could interpret this in architecture. And so one of our early work then was to see how we could use this pattern, which is intermixing. And this was a building that we did. It was a 35-story building where um, we had a spotty relationship of vegetation. This is the plan of the building. You can see you have terraces with green all the way around. And that's the uh, view looking up. And that's the building was completed. Now, it's a fairly dreary building, I admit, and it, it was uh, was experiment for us. But I love this image because it's emblematic for me of what a green architecture should be. A green architecture, I contend, deserves its own aesthetics. It should be indeterminate, it should not look pristine, and it should look what I call hairy. You know, when this building was finished, all my friends said, this looks like the hairiest building in Southeast Asia. And that's what, to me, green architecture is about. It should be should be indeterminate hairy. And so this was the first experiment I had with uh, green, with, uh, with putting vegetation facade in, into buildings, trying to bring the biotic and abiotic <coughs> into, into, into the built form. The idea is, of course, the, the spiraling relationship, the much more integrated relationship. And I started to look at how we could achieve this. And one of my early ideas was to use a combination of trellis and planter boxes bring it up, this, you know, one side of the building, goes across the floor and up the other side. And here it is, this is the first building we did for IBM uh, back again in the late 80s. And you can see the step terraces and, and the planted boxes. And then when you reach the middle of the floor, it actually cuts across the floor. And I told the client, this is the plant room, which is really where you put plants and plants, you know, mechanical plants and artificial plants. And then the other side of the building goes up again. But at that time, this led to my discovery of what I call the biochromatic skyscraper, where I used the, uh, the service calls as buffers between the inside and outside. Um, the elevators would have natural ventilation so that it reduces, the in, it, you, you don't need to pressurize it, similar for the staircase and the toilets. And, so, and then the floor plates are oriented exactly north-south to reduce um, solar insulation on the hot sides of the building. And so this is back in the late 80s. And that's the second method I, I started to develop in bring vegetation up to buildings. But the ideal relationship remains an unreachable thing for me at that time. I didn't want to have the spotty relationship, you know, as you can see with the diagram on the left. Even though some species in nature, such as birds, butterflies, and insects, can move from one patch to another patch, but the terrestrial type species couldn't. And so the ideal relationship is the spiraling relationship, as you can see in the diagram on the right hand side. Because by being connected, because in nature everything's connected, ecological nexus is important because it enables species migration, enables species interaction. And by being connected, it, it engenders a larger pool of natural resources for the species and makes them, enhances biodiversity and makes them much more stable and can exist without the uh, interference of human beings. And so this was a competition scheme we did in Singapore back in the late 90s. And so you can, you can imagine over 10, 20 years, these ideas started to continue to develop, continue to progress, being frustrated in one, but we start, still kept plugging at it. And we, this was a competition we got second prize. We didn't win. And this is a water road in Singapore. And again, but with this scheme, we had a, a spiraling ramp this time. <coughs> This is the model of the scheme, and the ramp was, it was a cultural building. We had cafes, we had galleries, we had, uh, we had uh, cafes, we had gourmet restaurants, and this ramp that with, a, with a spiraling vegetation continues all the way up to the building. It wasn't until 2005, you know, nearly 20 years afterwards, that we started to realize the idea of the, of the spiraling ramp, and this was the genome research building at the University of Hong Kong. And the site actually abuts uh, a, 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 a green area, 
right next to it. And this time we put the greenery through the ramp, and if you like, a dog leg staircase of plants leading out up to the roof, and that was 1998. Eventually, 2005, we were able to achieve what we thought was an impossible dream. This is a Solaris building in Singapore, and this was the concept uh, drawing for it. Now, one of the requirements in Singapore is that we had to replace, to get the green platinum rating, we had to replace 100% or more of the green of the ground cover in the building. And to achieve this without losing a gross floor area became a challenge for architects. And so what we did was to have a spiraling ramp this time on the facade. With every floor we climb up, with every facade I climb up one floor. And I call this a linear park in the sky. And that if you stretch it out, it's actually 1.3 kilometers long, probably the longest linear park in the sky. And we did a drawing of it. And that's what it looks like. You can walk on the path, you have vegetation on one side, facade building on the inside. So this is back in nine, 2005. And over a period of 10, 20 years, we finally got this built. This is what it looks like. You see the walkway, you see the vegetation, you see the facade. And so that's the fourth, if you like, in the concept for integrating vegetation buildings. And that's another view of this. The original master plan was done by Zaha. She won it from competition. She beat Toru Ito and people like that. And we are phase two, so that's the little square, you know, uh, red square. And the top left corner is phase one, uh, which, is, uh, which is done by Kisho Kurukawa. Um, Zaha's master plan, you know, uh, determined the building form, and that every corner of the building had a different height. And so this, you know, this was the building form that we concluded with. It's not something that uh, we, we came up with ourselves, but we, we were told to max the gross floor area, and that's the building form, and here it is. The building is full, and then you can see the planting that climbs up along the sides of the facade, and at different levels I have, I have roof gardens uh, at, at in between intermediate levels going up to the top. And that's the side view of the garden. But where the terraces, where the, where the, uh, the ramps hit the corner, it opens up into a, into a terrace, uh, which then connects with the, uh, with the insides of the building. And that um, the building is rated green mark platinum, which is Singapore's equivalent of Briam or LEED. And that we saw the rating system, nothing is nothing more than just an index. And the requirement for, 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 for biodiversity uh, for in the green mark is six. And we doubled it, we got 12.2. And so this is what we try to do with green design, which would exceed the performance requirements of any rating system, because any rating system is just a tick box that we should try and use it only as a checklist. And so back to this idea of, of integrating organic, we wanted then to bring it not just to the ground, but into the basement as well. And so we developed the idea of what we call the EcoCell. EcoCell is, in this project, we had uh, it says water tank that collects rainwater, and this is what the eco cell looks like in this project. You can see the vegetation can you continue all the way down to the basement, and there it is, it was located. And it collects not just the, uh, the rainwater, but also the condensate from the air conditioning system. The original idea for the eco cell was developed in our master plan uh, for the Calvin waterfront. This was our entry for the Calvin waterfront, and um, the, the client in, actually, it was a public competition, and we, we don't do competitions for no fee. And so we, we asked for us, tried to look for a sponsor, and um, the sponsor actually appointed three architects and gave us all some money to do the competition. And so they paid us some money. Uh, the second competitor was Norman Foster, and the third was Tange. And of course, later on, I discovered that they paid me the least money, but what do I care? Anyway, um, within the master plan, these, we developed the idea of the eco cells, and these are the location of the eco cells. And the idea of the eco cell was to bring vertical integration of vegetation right down into the middle of the building, down to the basement, provides opportunity for rainwater harvesting, for natural ventilation, for daylight. And at the bottom, we can put a living machine or a bioswale. And so um, we also collect the, uh, the bioswales, so the, uh, the water tank also collects the condensate from the, uh, from the air conditioning uh, system in the building. Another eco cell is this, um, this one, which is also in Singapore. This is um, in the National Library in Singapore, a project that we won in competition. And this is what it looks like from the basement. And in the, in the, uh, in the Solaris building, this is the ground floor plan, 
and the, this is the eco-cell. But in the middle of the solar ice building, to reduce energy consumption, we had an atrium going all the way, going all the way up. So this is the atrium. This is a simulation of the comfort conditions within the atrium, at least for the simulations. But on top of the atrium, we have an operable, um, the back to, half back to the, my idea of the building as an environment filter. We had automated glass louvers, which on a good day is open, but as soon as there's uh, rain, it automatically shuts, and that's what it looks like you know, the, on top of the atrium. And this is the, uh, the idea of the environmental filter over a period of 20, 30 years. It, you know, it's perpetual, it's continuous, and we continue to pursue it. But that's the roof. We wanted to find a solution for the walls, and so the size of the building, we developed what we call a rain check wall. Our earlier design was just a straight glass wall, and then we started to develop the idea of a ziggurat wall, where the vertical components elements is glass, horizontal is, is uh, perforated metal. The idea was to let the wind through and keep out the rain. And as we started to develop it, we, 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 we angled the vertical, uh, uh, vertical uh, elements and, and we kept the perforated metal um, horizontal. So this is what it looks like on the right hand side. This is what it looks like when it's built. And this is the rain check wall that we developed for the scheme. Sun shading are huge sun shades, and we, because we had to meet an uh, index called the OTTV value, which has to be less than 40 watts per square meter. And so the sun shades about 800 millimeters wide and extends from the outside of the building, and this is what the sun shade looks like. At the same time, we wanted to explore the idea of what we call a diagonal shaft. Diagonal light shaft is basically a shaft that we cut through the floor, and it's, you know, it's just a little small rectangle that you can see there, and it cuts diagonal across the floor and that it opens on the top of that uh, one side of the block, and you can see what it looks like on the right hand side. That's the top of the, light, of the diagonal light shaft. And then at the bottom, when you walk <coughs> past the building, you're look, not looking at the facade, the plain facade, but you actually look up at the building. You can see the skylight, you can see the floors in between, you can see light upstairs. This is a simulation of the light conditions in a light shaft, and if we were to develop this further, we would have put photographic glass to try and bring daylight to the, uh, to the bottom parts of the light shaft. Now, one of the things that we get asked the most is that, what is the benefit of green buildings? Why green buildings? How are you commercially justified? For a long time, we, we tell people that designing green is an ethical issue. But actually, we discovered in this building that the, uh, the savings in energy and water is equivalent to something about 530,000 US per annum, which is almost you know, 70 cents US per square foot. And so, if you, then another question I get asked most often is how much does it cost to go green? Is, do you have to pay a premium? For this building, we delivered at 6.5% over industry's costs for this uh, building type. Um, most quantity of surveyors, cost consultants recommend you should budget 48%. But for low cost, because you're, saving, you're searching for, for, to make things low cost, uh, the cost of making low cost buildings green is, is higher because between 10 to 25%. And for high end buildings, you can actually go down to 2%. So there is, for, for any buildings which are high-end, there is no reason why you cannot make it green because it does cost an arm to make them green. And so during construction, there's recycling materials or you know, of, of, uh, of timber from work. Then the next was to see how we can use, what to explore the idea of the green wall. And this is the, uh, a data center for a telecommunication company, a Swedish company called DG. And um, the idea was to start from the ground and wave its way up to the top of the building in a connected way because we want to make things connected. And you can see all the four facades that, that from one facade links to another facade, links to another facade in the, in the, in the green armature. Then behind the green wall uh, is the air conditioning intake so that the, so that the air is scrubbed by the vegetation before it enters the building. And this is the lower part of the green wall. And that, if you like, is the fifth way we brought green up the building. Now back to this um, um, biointegration, um, we moved from physical to systemic. Now at this point, you think, oh well, all Ken does is just put veggies in those buildings. And so we wanted to move beyond just putting vegetation buildings. We wanted to design buildings like living systems, or like what I call constructed ecosystems. So back to the scheme that we designed in Korea in Gyeonggi, um, this is the vegetation for the scheme, and what we did was to, this, this is the master plan. And within the master plan, we create what we call habitats. 
different areas, different spaces where different species can survive, and that the habitats could be green walls, green, green roofs, you know, green, you know, green atriums, green plazas, green patches in the ground, bastards, and so forth. And so we create different habitats within this master plan, and we line up all the habitats in a row. And at the same time, we did species on native vegetation, native species that we want to bring back to the site. Not alien species, but native species. And so these are the different native species we want to bring back, you know, the native fauna we want to bring back. And that then we combine the two together in what we call the biodiversity matrix. And so different habitats were created for different species. And then once we work out this, habit, uh, this uh, biodiversity matrix, the next stage was to create landscape conditions in which each species could survive over the four seasons of the year, and that, uh, you know, here are over the four seasons of the year, and whether it's for feeding, breeding, for refuge. So in this way, the whole building then becomes a system, whole becomes a total living system. And this, to me, is the state of the art what green design is about. It's not just about lead, it's not just about, you know, Brienne, it's not just about, um, you know, um, meeting, you know, getting Brienne green, uh, excellent, but it's actually trying to, 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 to make our human built environment integral with the living, with the natural environment. And so this is a scheme that we did in Korea, and that's the climatic responses. And the side of the atriums, we have slits so that the air again that enters the atrium is filtered by the green wall uh, before it enters the building. And we try and put large trees in the atriums um, in the scheme. So there you are. These are the, these are the four elements, the four constituents. But what I found most architects do is that when they design a green building, they're only looking at the building. They should actually look at not just the building, but the entire region. That's a competition that we did in Istanbul. Uh, we won the competition, uh, and our competition size is only that small rectangle. But we look at the region as a whole, and to a horror we found that human beings have actually eaten the landscape. Over a period of 20 years, you can see, you know, the, the region has been a significant effect by human beings. Whereas by deforestation, by urbanization, or by agriculture, the only part of the green area that's existent is that little strip of green at the top. And so when we did this competition, we wanted to reconnect the greenery to make nature whole, if you like, make nature whole again. And so this was our scheme to connect everything together. But there's an existing roads, the existing highways, the existing bridges, and the existing railway lines. How do we connect greenery? So the idea we had was to have what we call eco-bridges. You have two pieces of land which are separated by, uh, fragmented by, by this highway in between. What happens if you bridge it? What happens if you landscape it? Then suddenly, what, you, what used to be two disparate uh, bits of nature that human beings have fragmented, suddenly becomes whole. Because we tend, whenever human beings go on the land, we fragment it, we chop it up the little pieces with roads and drains and highways. What, what we need to do is to reconnect with ecological bridges, and this is the model of the scheme. And these are where all the eco bridges are. So to try and reconnect all the green areas and to make it connected as a whole. This is the green eco structure. This is the road system, that is the waterways. And this is the master plan to try and reconnect the, the, um, the buildings and the greenery in the natural environment. But to justify this, to make this commercially viable, we, we told Istanbul, the, the Turkish authorities that make this the single largest park that Istanbul can ever have, have commercial activities there, you know, uh, permissible within, different, um, um, within the ecology of the land. And this was our scheme for this project. And this is what the eco bridge looks like. And that's the scheme that we designed for Istanbul. Oh dear. What happened? Did somebody touch something or what? I lost the, uh, lost the part, right? Wait a minute. Let's go back again.
sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's downloading, so you give it a few minutes. Yeah. Whoa. There you are. Oh, that's all right. So back to this diagram of the four constituents, I started to look at it in a different way, and I called, I started to color code them. I called this the green, I called them infrastructures. And, and we, I saw this as a way of designing the eco-city, if you like. And I called it the green, the eco, green infrastructure, the ecology. Uh, gray would be the clean technology, clean uh, engineering, and blue would be the water water management, which you should try and close the loop as much as possible. And red, as us as human beings, our lifestyles have to change. The way we live have to change. The way we move about has to change. And so I started to look at master plans, but starting with the green infrastructure. This is the master plan we designed for a, for a site in, in, in the Indian Ocean in an island called uh, La Réunion, uh, which is an island near Madagascar. And this is the... Uh, the site where we did the deep master plan. This is giving in an idea of the of the of the of the of the environment that we're designing. You know, fairly low uh, vegetation, tropical vegetation, uh, with low rise buildings, and that's the master plan. These were the habitats we created within the site, the green infrastructure. What we tried to do was to bring the vegetation from the hills all the way down to the plains, and to bring it right down to the waterfront. And these were the different habitats within the site. These were the species what they bring back. And um, these are some of the images of the species. This is the equivalent of biodiversity matrix. And that's the, uh, the site that we did the, the deeper master plan. And that's the overview of the site. And here what we want to do, as you can see in this diagram, is to bring a series of fingers into the land. And so we had ecological corridors, which goes underneath using eco undercrofts and eco bridges going all the way up to the hills, so that the ecology of the hill is connected to the ecology of the waterfront. And this is the master plan itself. You can see the green areas. You know, you can see the, uh, the, the, the built-up areas in between and with the vegetation. And that we had eco undercrofts so that the roads that cut across north-south, um, we had the vegetation continues underneath it. So you can see the bridges that links one part of the site to another part of the site. And so the opposite of eco-bridge is the eco undercroft. That's the master plan, and, th and then uh, that's the view of the development from the waterfront. 
you can see the greenery, the green fingers going in, and this is the view from the hills looking down into the waterfront. And these are the uh, various uh, parts of the site. The blue, the gray would be the, the clean technology. Now, how do we give a, a loca location which is so vehicle dependent and make it, um, make it, give it a sustainable transportation system? And so even though we had a, a vehicle, a, a movement system, what we proposed was to have a system that, you know, that is dependent on public transport and that we had a progression to move from existing uh, uh, private vehicles eventually to, uh, to electric vehicles and, 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 a, and, a, and a vehicle system which used electric, electric carts um, and bicycles rather than um, dependent on non-renewable fossil fuels. And we wanted the whole project to be, um, to be using renewable wind resources, renewable wind, renewable using wave power um, as a source of, of, uh, of energy. We wanted to close the water cycle as much as possible. And this is, uh, this is the water, um, water pie. And what happened, what we found was that actually most of the rain is on the wrong side, on the east, uh, east side of the island. So we had to collect the rain from the east side and pump it, you know, and let it flow to the right hand side. And, and um, this is the water cycle. And then for the human beings, for the human lifestyles, uh, we wanted to create a plaza in the sky for them so that, you know, because there's a very high rate of on the unemployment on the island. There's two, three generations of unemployment. And so all they did was just to go out for picnics all the time. And so we created employment for them and we created a central plaza which is raised above ground. And the idea was to have a seven minute walking distance so that everybody is discouraged from using private cars and that within seven minutes you can walk to uh, the convenience store, a doctor, the postman, the police, the cafe, and so this was the basis for the scheme, the seven minute walking distance. And these are different activities you could have within the site, and that's the uh, master plan, and you can see the detail of the layout <coughs> for the site. The idea was to give them huge terraces so that they can just sit out and, and have, uh, and have you know, be close to the vegetation, close to the uh, nature, and looking out into the waterfront. So that was the idea, that, e that eco-city design is the integration of these four eco-infrastructures into a whole. And so when we design a site, the first thing we do is look at this, what I call a simple diagram showing biodiversity. And this is the master plan that we designed for a site in India, uh, in Bangalore. And you can see Bangalore is, uh, well actually it's not good ground, but it's about 20 degrees above the equator. It's fairly diverse. And the site abuts a, a nature reserve. And so in this scheme, what we did was to collect all the species in the spine and bring it across the site, stretch it across the site. And so this is the master plan. You can see the, the spine to collect the vegetation. We, so we start with the green infrastructure and bring it across the site. So we connect to the adjoining sites, and that's the green infrastructure across the, across the site. And then this is the water cycle. So we try and close the loop as much as possible. The water that falls on the land stays in the land rather than it just goes in the drain into rivers and it's gone forever. And so the idea was to use bus wheels to bring it back to have detention ponds. You can see the little red squares that shows where the detention ponds are so that the water is collected, the, you know, the surface water collected and brought back to the ground. And we have small eco cells um, that bring the water, uh, bias wheels that bring water back to the ground. And then for the black water, the sewage, the idea was to have a natural process of treatment so it goes from a series of filtration ponds without use of any mechanical means. So in this way, the whole water cycle is designed as a complete natural system. And then for the infrastructure, which is the engineer, which is the energy distribution systems, then in the road system, what we found that there's a crisscrossing between the green infrastructure and the roads. So we're back to the idea of the of the uh, of the eco bridge, and so this eco bridge across the site. And so in this way, uh, we can able to con maintain a continuity of vegetation across the site. And when you put all these together, this is what we call, it, this is for me, uh, an eco master plan because you have the integration of the four basic infrastructures, the water management, the human lifestyles, um, the, the engineering, the clean technology engineering, and the green infrastructure into a whole. And so this is uh, what I started with. I mentioned the idea of eco-architecture and eco-master planning. 
ideas and concepts. And I want to have four images I want to leave in your mind. That green design is the integration of these four aspects, nature, human beings, our activities, water and, and water management, our built environment, everything making the uh, as a whole. And to try and seek to achieve this objective, what are called um, constructed ecosystems, designing buildings as, 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 as living systems rather than as dead inorganic physical uh, systems. These are different ways we brought vegetation into, into the buildings. I call this juxtaposition, I call this um, physical integration. But for STEM integration would be a biodiversity matrix. And that if we can find better ways to integrate everything that we make and do with the, with, with the natural environment that's in this diagram, we find, you know, find these ways to integrate our, our built environment equivalent to a prosthetic device with its host organism in the biosphere, that we are, then we have achieved a successful green design. a lot of questions. <laughs> I got to tell you that um, when I first came to AA, the first lecture I heard was given to me by Charles Jennings, and the lecture was on classicism. He was just, you know, he spoke about Panofsky's book on classicism. So fast forward 20 years, and I said, Charles, do you remember that, uh, that uh, you know, the first lecture you gave was on classicism? And he said to me, that means you've been brought up right. 
So, um, back to back to um, the uh, the spatial aspect of architecture. I I think I could have made buildings a lot more organic. You know, integrated spaces. You know, to to have a much more um, diverse uh, internal spatial environment. There is a diagram. That I have a different lecture on, on designing the skyscraper, which I didn't, you know, show today. But um, I showed how the skyscraper could become uh, much more um, de-stratified, if you like. I think this is maybe that's the word you want me to to say is that architecture <coughs> is too stratified. We need to de-stratify and and to, and to and to make the species much more organic. Um, which reminds me of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. As you know, Frank Lloyd Wright hates Corbusier. And when Corbusier designed this building uh, with a hole in it and a tree pun you know, you know, you know, punching through that hole, Frank Lloyd Wright said, you know, look at Cobb, he's uh, sanitized, he's quarantined nature. And so um, this is what I'm trying to do, trying to, trying to, uh, trying to, uh, to de-stratify the building. I haven't been entirely successful in it. But there, there's so much to do. You know, I haven't, I haven't even got my head around the idea of human lifestyles and how, you know, uh, our lives should change, the way we move should change, and different ways and how it affects the architecture. And and for me, architecture really should 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 uh, should create a new form of internal life. If it doesn't create a new form of internal life, it's just facadism. It's just like, you know, uh, your facade's better than my facade. And sometimes when I look at buildings designed by famous architects and that it looks wonderful on the outside. But the inside is just an ordinary building, it's an ordinary office building. And so we need to look at the lifestyles, and I haven't done that. And I've got to admit that, that, you know, that there is this part of my agenda, and hopefully I'll cover this before, you know, I start pushing daisies. Um, so, now Singapore is different. Singapore is, uh, when it does something, it does it extremely thoroughly. And, and, and aggressively, thoroughly, and that's good because then if you don't get, you know, green mark rating, you're not going to get planning approval, and and even the building department in Singapore does research on biodiversity, on research on, on energy, the research on systems, and so it is actually a very progressive uh, government, which I can't see this happening anywhere else in the world, you know, even in Germany where there's a lot of research being done. Um, it's done by the private sector and not initiated by the government. And so that's Singapore for you. Singapore, when it wants to do something, does it extremely well. And that's a good thing. I haven't been able to answer your other questions, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Ken, yes. I'd like to pick up on a, a word you dropped in just there. Right. Green design has for you been an, an evolutionary journey it's not a recent experience. No. Um, and your, part of your striving is the broadest sense of the word integration. So the word I'd like to pick up on is, I hope to see you start. What do you hope to see over the foreseeable future as the next evolution of green design? Oh, the next evolution, as I mentioned, is to, you see, we architects are not particularly powerful people, we're just designers. And we're subject to the whims and fancies of our client. But what we could do is to use our knowledge and persuade our client, because most clients ask, you, ask me to do green building, and once they've done a green building, they say, oh, that's it, I've done my bit for the world, and, and then move on with their own pollutive uh, uh, businesses and industries. What we, what we need to do is to persuade our clients to make the businesses green, to make the industries green, to make the economies green, to make politics green, and so by doing this, then, then we actually truly influence the world, we, you know, uh, perhaps insidiously, perhaps surreptitiously, but that's, I think, one of the functions of an architect. Um, and of course, as I mentioned in my lecture and in my presentation, that there's still a lot more to be done. Um, there, you know, there, I have done little experiments in, 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 the, in, in, the, in, in the facade as, as, an, as, a, as a rain check wall, but the idea of, of, of an intelligent facade, you know, is something that we, I have still haven't been able to achieve. I remember, you know, uh, Ron Heron was telling me that the intelligent facade is like the skin of the building. It's, it's homostatic, you know, that when, when the building is cold, 
it, it shudders, it, it shrinks, and, and, and that's the idea, ideal of, of intelligent facade. And so if we're able to have intelligent facade, you know, that, that, that conserves energy, that saves water, which is green at the same time, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the things we could do. Now, with materials, ideally, um, you know, at the moment, most people are just, you know, looking at green materials. But we should try and design buildings in, uh, with what, you know, in what I call DFD, design for disassembly. And from day one, materials are used in such a way that it facilitates recycling. That means all the joints, you know, in materials um, should be mechanically fixed rather than chemically bonded. Once it's chemically bonded, like in plastery or with brickwork, then recycling becomes more difficult. And so we, we only just started to think about, you know, DFD, you know, how to design for this assembly. So there's so many things we can do. And that when we talk about, uh, talk about clean technology and, and carbon neutral, the amount of engineering that goes into making, you know, a, a building in, uh, in a carbon neutral is immense. It doesn't sometimes it makes total nonsense of, 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 of designing a low energy building because, you know, the embodied energy in the equipment and in engineering is so significant where it's worth the effort, you know. I mean, so these are some of the things, the next generation, you know, uh, uh, there's still a lot more to be done. But at the end of the day, personally, I think green design is just a phase in our human, in architecture. And that within 10 years time, it will be part and parcel of everybody's uh, uh, architectural method and approach. Then we can really focus on what architecture which is, is about, which is to make people happy, to, to, to give them pleasure in their life. You know, uh, and one of the most famous architects in Sri Lanka is a gentleman called Jeffrey Bauer. And somebody asked him on his deathbed, Mr. Bauer, what exactly is architecture about? And he says only one thing, to make people happy. Now, if we're so involved with green, we forget about making people happy. And so I hope that in the next generation of architects, the students, the architects of, of within the next decade or so, will do green design a second nature to them. They don't even have to think about it, they're already doing it. Then they can focus on what architecture is about, to create beautiful objects, to get objects to make people happy, to make, give pleasure to their lives, and to meet, uh, and, and similarly for planning. And this, this is what we should be doing. That I see as the, as the, next, as the next generation, you know, uh, for, 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 the, for the architecture community. Well, I'm his, oh, oh dear, four questions. Yeah. I was just wondering because uh, one of your kind of work that you showed uh, tonight is very kind of design based and heavily kind of articulating kind of some design ideas and it ranges from scales from let's say the isolated component uh, detailing in, on the facade uh, all the way to kind of how you are laying, kind of lay, lay out spaces in the building. So how does this kind of what power does design have against a more kind of mechanical based approach where engineering and all of the underlying systems in the building actually provide all of the sustainable aspects of it? Like, uh, what is the kind of efficiency in terms of the design based approach versus a more engineering based approach where, you know, an engineer just designs systems and the architect is more of a secondary role in that sense? Is there any kind of difference between or can design overpower an engineering kind of approach? Right. Um, difficult. It's a long conversation you've got to have on this stuff. But, you know, two things. Um, most of the green architects that you meet today are basically essentially engineering driven. You know, the tendency is that you put the whole facade of photovoltaics, like with solar collectors, or you have the recycling system, that's green design. That to me is just engineering. We must not forget ecology. And so that's my response, if you like. It's not about design. It's not about engineering, but architecture is about ecology. We we'll start with the biosphere and, and how we can uh, bring uh, what we do as human beings uh, and relate it in a, in a benign way to the natural environment. But talking about engineers and, and other professions, um, the other day I was reading a book called Detour. I don't know how many of you have read it. It was written by uh, an American architect um, who, who did architecture, and, and, that, and after that he did a uh, uh, MBA, and he said that the two ways that an architect can 
bring back uh, the respect that he used to have as an architect. And because you know we, we, we keep losing everything that we do, you know we used to cost buildings now quite the surveyors do it. We used to manage the projects now project managers do it. You know uh, we used to uh, design structure now structure engineers do it. We used to do mechanic, you know the engine, environmental systems now the MA engineers do it. You know I, I had a client the other day, and he said to me, you know Ken, I think architects are very vague people. I say what do you mean? He says I asked my architect, uh, you know. Um, does, can the building stand up? He says, I have to check with my structure engineer. Ask my architect, um, how much does it cost? I'll check with the QS. Ask my architect, do you think that condition will be too cold? He says, I have to check with, my, with the M&E engineer. So I ask my architect, what exactly do you do? <laughs> but anyway, back to this book, he says that to bring, to, 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 to get the respect, to regain the respect from the client community, there are two things an architect can do that no other member of the building industry can do better than him. First one is the interpretation of the client's brief. And that is something that we should spend time on. Whenever we meet a client for the first time, we should understand his brief, find out what he really wants as against what he really needs, and that to give ideas and, and to show different ways to interpret it. And so right, working with a client on the design brief, that's one way to, to gain back the client's respect. Second is to give ideas. I cannot imagine a quantity surveyor giving ideas to a client. I can't imagine an engineer giving ideas to a client, although some engineers do. And I can't imagine any mechanical engineers would do it. And so if you work with a client and you say, you know, these are the possible ideas, this possible ways to do this, the client thinks, well, here's a bright and, and creative architect. So these are two ways. And this book, Detour, also says that green architecture is another way of, of the architect gaining leadership again back into the design into, into, into uh, in, in the building industry. So these are different ways of doing this. Now, several years ago, the RIBA, and this goes maybe about 10, 15 years ago, um, when uh, uh, I did a, they found that 70% of the work that goes to architects did stop going directly to architects. It went through project managers, went through quantity surveyors, went through con design build contractors. And so it did a survey to find out what went wrong, what did the profession do, that lost the confidence of the client. He came up with two conclusions. First one, the architect lost his role as the client's friend. Being the client's friend basically means this. If something goes wrong in your life, who do you go to? You go to a doctor, you go to your, your aunt, you go to your best friend. Your best friend, even though he's not an expert, will advise you. And so you know, the architect lost his role as the client's friend. If something goes wrong with a project, the client should come to you first not to the project manager, not to the engineers, not to the surveyors, you should seek advice. And then the third thing to discover from this survey is the architect relegated control of costs to somebody else, the quantity surveyor. Now, money is the most important thing in all of us, in all our lives. And yet the architect you know, couldn't care about clients. Money is so interested in designing that he would use the control, he did not control costs, can control uh, um, budgeting, Control and control the you know the way money is spent, and so one of the things that we should either they recommend by this survey is that we should go back and control costs, because the most important thing in every client's mind, which is cost. No matter how rich the client is, we must control costs. And so these are the two ways we can gain back the respect of the client community. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs>